today's lecture, we're going to start talking about development, and we're going to start that with where development begins, infancy and childhood. Now, we did skip over the prenatal development, which is very interesting, and if any of you are curious, I'd be happy to provide some information to you. Uh, but to keep the pace of the semester going, we're going to skip over prenatal, because we've already spoken about some of that, and we're going to learn about infancy and childhood. So this lecture will cover infancy through childhood, which for the purposes of this lecture, infancy is defined as as soon as you're born to toddlerhood. Childhood is toddlerhood to essentially, uh, you know, right when you start developing sexually. So we're talking about teenager puberty. Uh, so infancy is newborn to toddler. Childhood is toddler to raging 13-year-old asshole. So that's the way we're going to look at it. Now, infant psychological development depends heavily on their biological development. So to understand the emergence of motor skills and memory, we have to understand the brain and how it develops as well. So with that, let's look at the developing brain. So I mentioned the last lecture, um, or rather on the lecture on neurons, um, about pruning. So let's learn a little bit more about how this process happens. So when you're born you have neurons not very well connected. As you can see you've got just kind of a couple. But by 15 months you have this massive web of connections between existing neurons. And so basically what happens is your developing brain throws out a bunch of neurons. Just a ton of neurons and then they connect and they join together and so when one neuron is stimulated it generates stimulation in another neuron and the process goes on and on so these neuron neural connections flower at this exponential rate but they're subsequently pruned back based on what connections go used and what connections go unused so this is where way back in the beginning I was talking about if you don't use it you lose it when it comes to the brain so what we see here is that your genes and your experiences are setting you up for an easy mental life provided that your parents and you yourself when you make the ability or when you have the ability to make the effort put energy into maintaining these neural connections this is why young people are so much more adept at learning languages they're so much more adept at learning instruments because they already have more mapping available to them but many of these connections could become redundant uh, you know not necessary for survival or for even things of enjoyment um, or possibly even detrimental to have that many connections. So as you age and develop, those unused and therefore deemed unnecessary connections get pruned away. So this whole process is known as maturation. So it's the development of something that happens over time that's known as maturation. Now, as I'm sure you guys know, all little boys don't mature, psychologically speaking, emotionally speaking, at the same time. Same is true of all little girls. You know, people develop in the same process, but not at the same speed. You know, you and I can be walking side by side. We can be putting the same amount of effort into it. But because you've got a greater stride length than me, or because of some other factor, one of us might come out a little bit quicker than the other, but we all have to go through the same steps. So with the example of a baby, they stand before they walk, they battle before they talk. This is the process of maturation, and it's a genetically predetermined order, but the environment and your genetic predispositions control the pace of the process through maturation. So let's take an example from motor development. Infants first start out with rolling over, and then at about six months, roughly speaking, uh, they might start sitting unsupported and be able to hold themselves up. They might start crawling between eight to nine months, beginning to walk at about a year, and doing just fine on their own at 15 months. 
So there's little effect on the sequence, but there's a huge effect on timing. You see crawling between eight to nine months? That's not set. I've known babies that started crawling at six months. Forget sitting un unsupported at six months. They were doing that at four months, but they were crawling at six months. So uh, let's give an example of experience not having an effect on the sequence, but instead having an effect on the pace. I'm one of those babies that learned how to walk early. I just did. I learned how to walk when I was probably about 10 months old. The reason for this is probably manyfold, but I'm going to give two primary examples. One, I'm a second child, and two, I have a dog. So let's examine how these interact and, and result in me walking a little bit earlier. Having had an older sister, I wanted to get up and run around with her. I didn't want to lay around and just, you know, ooh and ah at stuff. I wanted to move around and play with my older sister. So that's an environmental and an experiential factor that impacted my desire to start walking earlier, which then impacted, uh, you know, the, the result of me ultimately walking earlier. But what about the dog? Well, I had the most amazing dog, and I'll, I'll probably find a way to post a picture in the lecture later on. Uh, his name was Linus. He was a total badass. He was the best dog I've ever had. Um, and he, uh, he would let me grab his fur and pull up on him. So when I'm right at the crawling age, I was holding on to his fur and standing up and just kind of looking around. After a little while, he got a little tired of standing there while I was pulling on his fur, and so he would gradually start walking. And I just kind of trundled behind him. And that's how I started working, or started walking rather, at about 10 months of age instead of a year. I wanted to get up and play with my sister, and then instead of having one of those little scooters that, you know, little babies hold on to and they walk around, I had a dog. And I was holding on to that sucker for dear life, trying to stay supported behind him so that I didn't fall on my ass. So experience can impact the speed, but there was no way that I could start crawling before I was sitting upright. It's just not going to happen. So you can't change the order, but you can change the pace. So... One of the other things that's developing during these times are our memory systems. So I don't know, you know, I, I know that there are people that claim that they have memories of being born. I call bullshit. I call bullshit. Because for most people, the earliest memory is between three and four years old. Uh, some people have memories from earlier than that, and they, they, they have very specific, typically emotionally laden memories. We're going to talk about why in a minute. Um... But the, the question then is, is what's going on that makes us have a hard time remembering anything be be before three or four? Well, if you go back and look at the brain, none of this is like, you know, you, you come out and bam, you've got your full brain fully developed. I mean, we look at those slides earlier here. Let me go back to them. Clearly, not everything is developed at birth. Because you see right here, you've got these individuals at 15 months that have way more neural mapping going on than those that born it, uh, you know, just straight off the bat. So, if we've got the brain developing neural connections, then perhaps there's even the possibility that brain structures aren't yet fully developed. And that's true, and that's what we find to be the case with the limbic system. So the limbic system, as we learned back in the brain lecture, was that it's essential for memory formation, um, as is the prefrontal cortex. Neither of these structures are fully developed, and they tend to be developed at around the age of three or four. So that's why we see one of the primary reasons for understanding why we have almost like an amnesia about our early childhood, is because we didn't have the structures in place in the brain to be able to put them into long-term storage. One of the things that we don't yet understand, though, is that um, this can't be the full reasoning for this amnesia that we experience. Because if I were to go up to a five-year-old and ask them to tell me something that happened to them when they were two, they would be much more likely to have a memory that's legitimate, that can be confirmed, than, say, me, I'm 26, I can't tell you 
anything that happened when I was two. I mean, my earliest memory, I was three, and it was a nightmare. So it was an emotional memory, which, because my limbic system was still rudimentary, wasn't able to fully move into long-term memory, but because it was an emotionally laden memory, all the fuel is in that area of the brain processing emotion, that's also the area of processing memory, and bam, you have a strong emotional memory. So let's talk about now some ways of looking at development throughout the years. I mean, we're not split, you know, as I said earlier, with infant and childhood. Those are not the only two stages of development. Far from. So we're going to talk about some cognitive development and some theories for understanding the different, um, or rather not the different, but the same process that we all go through that can be differently paced. So cognitive development, mostly we're going to be talking about Piaget. So Piaget was a, a brilliant psychologist that looked at how we develop and why we develop the way we do. And one of my favorite things about Piaget is that he classed humans as little scientists. And what he means by that is that we learn about the world through our experimental failures and successes. So we learn about the world by touching things, tasting things, experiencing them firsthand. Um, one of the unfortunate things about our current educational system, uh, and I'm speaking from the United States here, I can't speak with regard to any other countries, um, is that we actually kind of drill this little scientist desire out of most students, uh, which is pretty shitty, honestly. Uh, you know, kids, um, kids need to be allowed to fail. They need to learn that those failures have consequences. And then from that, they can learn a little bit more about their world and what that means. So we are failing students, I believe, at this point by not allowing them to be little scientists anymore. By telling them this is the answer, this is the only answer, and if you don't put down this answer in this exact method, you fail. Um, but as you can see from these two little kids right here, these are exactly the little scientists that Piaget was talking about. If you look at a slide, and you know how a slide works, but you don't get that the size is an important factor, then you've learned something, like this young man right here. Same is true of this, this little kid trying to get into a miniature car. We learn things by failing at life. And we take all these failures, and we put them together with things that we've learned from positive experiences, and from passive learning, from being taught things from family members. And we take all these experiences and we create schemas. And then we get new experiences and we see how well they fit with a schema. So let's take this example right here. We've got two-year-old Gabriella. She's just learned the word cow. And she knows what a cow is. And so she sees something that looks kind of like a cow. And she calls it a cow. Her mom says, no, sweetie, that's a moose. So now, instead of having the schema for cow, she has the cow schema, but then she also has a new schema for large, shaggy animals. Moose fits in large, sh shaggy animals. It doesn't fit in cow, but cow also fits in large, shaggy animals. So this is how we develop a classification system for understanding. So schemas are very malleable to experience, and there's two ways that we sort of change what we understand to be a schema. And those are assimilation and accommodation. So assimilation means incorporating new experiences into an existing schema. So let's say that a kid has a schema for large, shaggy animals. Well, if they know that a reindeer and a cow and a horse all fit into that, and then they learn about a moose, then they assimilate moose into their existing schema. But let's say that instead you've got something that doesn't fit and you have to consider what the schema represents and change that schema. 
That's known as accommodation, so adjusting the schema to account for new info. So those are the two different ways that we change how we categorize information over time. So as I mentioned before, this is, this is Piaget right here, a uh, brilliant psychologist, and this lecture is almost exclusively about him because he's been huge in the field of development. I mean, there are other researchers that have really fed into what we're discussing here, but, but, but he's the biggie. Uh, so we're going to talk about his theories for development. And he believed that we went through four primary stages of development. So the first one, and I'm just going to run through these quickly before I go into greater detail. Uh, the first one is the sensory motor stage, birth to about two years. Uh, from two to about six and a half, seven, we're in the pre-operational uh, 7 to 11 is right around concrete operations. And then at about 12 through adulthood is when we hit the former operations. Uh, so let's go into a little bit more detail about each of these stages. And then there are a number of milestones or developmental phenomena that we're going to discuss as well that happen uh, not necessarily at the culmination of each of these stages, but rather spaced throughout. So the first stage is sensory motor. And the sensory motor stage is really looking at how babies experience their world. They can't yet speak, so what they're doing is they're learning by touching and tasting and basically doing all the things that you try to stop them from doing. You know, when, when my niece was, I don't know, probably about five months old, my sister became the biggest clean freak. Now, this was just a phase for her. She's not a clean freak. She became the biggest clean freak for about five months, about the age of five months to ten months, because her baby, little Devin, would lay down on the floor and she would just find the smallest thing and she would just stick it in her mouth. Because she was in the sensory motor stage where they're taking in the world through their senses. So what are some of the milestones? Well, we've got this little baby right here displaying object permanence. So early in development, once something goes away, it's not important to the infant. They don't care about it. They don't know that it's gone because out of sight, out of mind. But once they hit about eight months, they're able to determine that when something goes out of your sight, it doesn't go away. That just means that you can't see it anymore. So if you have a dog and you're playing fetch with them and you pretend to throw the ball and then you hide it behind your back and they know that it's not where you threw it, they don't just forget about it. They go looking for it. And the same is true once you hit about eight months. You get object permanence where it's no longer out of mind just because it goes away. The other big milestone is what's known as stranger anxiety. So also at about, about eight months, um, babies will begin to develop a fear of other people. We're going to talk about stranger anxiety in a little bit more detail in just a little bit. Um, but the basic idea here is that at about eight months, Babies become very attached to their mothers and fathers, depending on how much they see them. Um, and they become very, very uncomfortable around strangers. And this is an understandable adaptive trait. Uh, and we're going to go into a bit more detail in just a few minutes. But let's examine some criticisms. Um, PHA basically thought that, that babies didn't think. They didn't have abstractions or ideas. Um, but this is, due to more recent research, found to be not necessarily true. Uh, that, that they can be amazed at things that don't make sense to us. And, and in fact, animals often show this as well. So they understand basic physics, and if you have a ball that suddenly stops in midair, they'll stare at it. So this is a way for us to test infant intelligence or infant understanding by how long they're looking at something. You know, because they can't tell us, what the fuck is going on here? Why is this ball levitating? They can't say that, but they can stare at it. And the amount of time that they stare at something is a good measure of how perplexed they are. Um, so while 
infants may not display behaviors which are stage appropriate, the building blocks for those behaviors may appear much earlier. And so that's part of how we can get around some of this criticism is that they may not develop the ability to show that they understand basic physics until later. But they may have the building blocks to understand it much earlier. So here's another example. Here's an example of how children can count. So they showed two objects, two little mouse dolls, on a stage. And they showed them being placed there. And then they pop up a screen, and an empty hand enters from one side over here, and an object is removed. So there's a possible outcome, the screen drops, and there's only one mouse left. Or, an impossible outcome, the screen drops and there are still two mice. So the babies that see the impossible outcome will stare much longer than the babies that see the understandable possible outcome. So this is what I'm talking about when we look at stare length for understanding whether or not a child fully grasps or is perplexed by something that's going on. So that's the sensory motor stage. Sensory motor stage is birth to two years, and we have those two main milestones, right? We've got stranger anxiety, and then we've also got object permanence. The next stage is what's known as the pre-operational stage. So from about two uh, to six and a half, seven years old, uh, basically these children cannot perform mental operations. So mental operations are the ability to understand various things uh, like conservation. Conservation is the idea that the quantity of something is the same regardless of any changes in shape. So in this picture right here, we've got this young man who's under seven. And, uh, you know, this, this man right here that is holding up, um, actually, huh. I can't tell if that's a man or a woman. Sorry, digression. Um, so we've got this individual over here holding up two flasks. And they invert one of the two flasks and ask the child, see now in the first slide right here, you can tell that the liquids are identical. In the second slide, they just invert the flask and ask the child to indicate which flask has more liquid. Now you and I know they have the same amount of liquid but this child is unable to determine that because the child does not yet understand the principle of conservation. So they're unable to use the mental operation of understanding that liquids don't change their volume by changing their shape. Now the main milestones that we see in the pre-operational stage are pretend play where they no longer have to, um, you know, play with something in front of them, they can begin to pretend and, and do uh, puppet shows or acting out things like, you know, let's play house or let's play school or doctor or army or whatever. Pretend play. Another one is egocentrism, which we're going to talk about in just a moment. And then the last one is language development, and this is really when they start to learn how to speak, and uh, egocentrism is going to influence some of the ways in which they speak. So some of the criticisms of the pre-operational stage are that, that some of the, these children are actually able to do mental operations at an earlier age than they should be if they lacked all of these milestones. So one of the things that I like to think of goes back to the very beginning, which is that perhaps we can't change the order of the stages, but we can change the speed at which they happen. So if the two and a half year old couldn't locate the stuffed dog, but the three year old could, and they're a that means they're able to use a mental operation, perhaps they hit that developmental milestone earlier than another individual, but they didn't jump ahead and hit milestones by skipping over other milestones. So the next milestone is egocentrism. 
Now, when, when you hear egocentrism, it sounds very selfish. It's, it's got a negative connotation. This is a little bit different. It's, it's not that children are selfish assholes. It's not what we're saying here. What, we're, what we mean by egocentrism is that they have very much difficulty trying to not only understand emotionally from someone else's perspective, but to physically see somebody else's perspective. So, uh, you know, when a, uh, let me give you this example, when a mom asks two-year-old Gabriella to show her a picture, she'll hold the picture facing herself because she doesn't grasp that her mom can't see through her eyes. So it's almost like they don't understand that other people exist and have an independent experience from them. It's just completely counter to something that they might possibly understand. Really throws them for a loop. The third stage happens, um, and this is sort of between six and a half to about twelve. This is the concrete operational stage. And basically what this does is this takes everything from the last stage and says that they're able to get conservation provided that they have the physical media in front of them. So if you were to uh, give them a visual, then they would be able to do the conservation, but they can't do it abstractly. Additionally, not only do they understand conservation, but they also understand mathematical transformations. So they know that 4 plus 8 equals 12, and then they can transform that backwards and say, well, if that's the case, then 12 minus 4 must equal 8, and 12 minus 8 must equal 4. So they get conservation. They just don't get it in the same abstract way as children typically do once they hit about the age of 12. So at about age 12, they hit the formal operational stage. And this is when children become, in my opinion, far more fascinating. Because this is when they're able to use symbolic thinking, imagination to examine and reason in a systematic fashion. And it's just, it's a really, really fun age. Because when kids are this age, they not only say ridiculous things, but they can understand and interpret them backwards in a way that allows them to solve problems in an abstract fashion. Now, going back to some of the criticisms, some of this thinking actually begins a lot earlier than suggested by Piaget. So a perfect example is you can ask a seven-year-old if John is in school, Mary is in school. John is in school. What can you say about Mary? Clearly, Mary is in school. Um, let me give you, because uh, I do love giving personal examples, so please forgive me. Let me give you a personal example from my own line, life showing how um, these formal operational stages can be achieved at a slightly earlier age, um, in large part due to experiential moments. So when I was in third grade, which, how old is third grade? Well, like 10? Something like that. Um, I was in third grade, so too early for the cutoff of formal operations, um, but, but early enough to have some of the rudiments of abstract thinking. My teacher posed this question to us. It was so frustrating for me to watch my classmates just not get it. Um, so the, the example was, if I have a flashlight, and she didn't have a flashlight, if I have a flashlight, and I'm standing in a dark alleyway, and I turn on the flashlight, and I set it down on the ground, and the beam shines for 12 meters. And then I take out a second flashlight of the exact same quality and caliber, and set it down next to the first flashlight. How far will their combined beams shine? So for someone who has hopefully gone through the formal operational stage, which I hope all of you have, you would know that the answer is, is quite obvious. It's only 12 meters. 
because putting the flashlight next to the other flashlight doesn't lengthen, uh, doesn't elongate the sense of how long the, the beam shines. It just makes it two beams next to each other. Well, all of my classmates, almost all of them, started adding it together. Some of them were silent and just thought about it. And me, I mean, I, I felt like possibly I was wrong because I kept raising my hand and saying, no, it's only 12. It, it, it's only 12. It's not 24. But everybody just kept answering 24, 24, 24. And so there was one moment where I finally raised my hand again and I was like, I'd like to reiterate my response is 12. And this is an example of abstract thinking that for me, for some reason or other, I have no idea why, um, I wound up hitting that that stage a little bit earlier than my classmates. It's not an intelligence thing, I just hit it a little earlier. I guess my parents had me thinking abstractly from an earlier age. So that's a perfect example of how these thinking processes can begin and often do begin much earlier than suggested by Piaget. Uh, but that the fact remains that you cannot change the order, you can really just change the pace. But, as with everything that I've taught you thus far, and everything that I'll teach you in the future, nothing happens in a vacuum. Nobody develops alone. We all develop in response to social interactions and, and you know, being social beings. So, let's talk a little bit about social development and how that happens over the ages. So, this little baby is just not happy. And this is because this baby is going through the all too common, pretty much everybody goes through it, stranger anxiety phase. So at about eight months, infants begin to form uh, this schema of, these are people that I know and that I trust and that will take care of me. These are familiar faces. Bringing a new face into that is terrifying for them. And so they very much struggle to assimilate new faces into this familiar faces schema. And as a result, they will scream and they will cry and they will be very upset. And it's perfectly normal. It's very frustrating for the adults in the situation, but it's a normal, healthy response. Part of the reason why it's a normal, healthy response is because it underlies the phenomenon of attachment. So attachment theory is fascinating. I've, I've done some research on it myself. And it's one of the earliest experiences that uh, shapes how you develop throughout the lifespan. So, you know, I, I spoke earlier about uh, the importance of genes and environment and how genes set the stage and experience determines where you fall in the continuum. For most things, early experience is huge. An early experience will influence how attached you are to your mother or your father or your primary caregiver. So the earliest attachment research uh, was done by Harry Harlow, which showed that infants bonded, uh, these were infant rhesus macaques, bonded with their surrogate mothers, not their wire mothers, because it was bodily contact comfort and not nourishment. So this is known as contact comfort. So the basic idea of the study was they raised these little guys in isolation. All they had access to were their mothers. And these were not real mothers, clearly. One of them was wrapped in terry cloth, was soft, and had a friendly face. The other one was very minimalistic, and it was a wire mother. And its only function was to provide milk through this little hole right here. This is where the bottle went. So there was the comfort mother and the nourishment mother. And they would do, I mean, the, the experiment was huge. They had lots of pieces involved in it. But like a perfect example of something uh, that, that they found that happened all too often was that the baby would cling to the terry cloth mother while suckling from the milk of the wire mother. They wouldn't even get on the wire mother to get to the milk. They would rather cling to the terry cloth mother. If something loud and frightening came into the room, they would run to the terry cloth mother for support. 
Now, a, an example from humans, and I spoke about this in the past, is the Romanian orphan studies. And basically what they find is that there is emotional, cognitive, and social decline in individuals that do not have exposure to someone tending to them physically. Someone touching them, someone holding them, and someone just giving them love. So they need that contact comfort. And in fact, a study like Harry Harlow's study with these rhesus macaques would no longer be approved. There is no IRB in the world that would grant researchers the right to take a being from its mother in this way. Uh, it's it's awful to look at the pictures, and I'm going to show you one in a minute uh, that just wrenches my heart uh, to look at because you know that these monkeys did not get to develop normally. So the origins of attachment are sort of like bodily contact, familiar familiarity, uh, which develop the attachment. Uh, some animals have a different form of attachment, like goslings, where they imprint, which basically means they see someone and then that's their mother. Uh, so if you've read the book, I'm sure a lot of you have, Are You My Mother? That's talking about one way of attachment development, which is imprinting. Now, uh, attachment, most people have a secure attachment means that uh, they explore the environment ha happily when they're in the presence of their mothers and when their mothers go away they show distress. So an unsecure attachment would be a baby that refuses to leave their mother's side when their mother is right there. So they display what's known as secure base behavior if they are securely attached. What this means is that mom can be sitting around reading a magazine and baby will go off and explore. Baby will look back at mom to make sure that mom is there. Baby might even go over and check on mom every now and again. But the baby feels comfortable in playing independently and shows distress when the mother walks away. Here's another example of an unsecure attachment. The baby doesn't give two shits if mother walks away. That is an insecure attachment. <clears throat> so the thing about attachment style is that it carries on throughout the lifespan and actually impacts your future relationships with other people. So something tells me that overattached girlfriend did not have a secure attachment growing up. She probably had a lot of fear about her parents leaving her. And as such, she fears her boyfriend will leave her as well. So secure attachment Sorry, the other 30% have the insecure attachment, which means that they cling to their caregivers, are less likely to explore the environment, or, on the opposite end, only care about exploring the environment and do not cling to their caregivers. So, this is a secure attachment, a relaxed and attentive caregiver. So, you know, we've got helicopter parents. Those don't lead to secure attachments. Those lead to insecure attachments. Because what you need is a caregiver that is, you know, paying attention to what's going on to you, but isn't going to freak out about every little thing. You know, I'm going to give an example from my niece's uh, life, and this is something that I hope you carry on when, you know, if and when you have your own children. Uh, they really respond to how you respond to them. So if you have a kid that falls down and you run over and you rush to them and you worry, are you okay, are you okay, they're more likely to freak out. So when Devin was a little baby and she would walk and she was learning how to walk and she would fall over, we didn't rush over to her. We looked at her. We would laugh and, and say, go bonk. And then she would just laugh. Now, if she was really hurt, of course she would cry because that's a natural response. But they're looking to you to understand how to respond to situations. And if you have a secure attachment, you will be relaxed and attentive to those individuals. So shoot for a secure attachment with your children. Now it's time for the sad picture. Insecure attachment. This is a baby monkey, this is a baby rhesus macaque that had experienced great anxiety. They removed the terry cloth mother, that's all they did. And they just removed the mother and that's what happened because the baby didn't have a secure attachment with that ter terry cloth mother. 
Sure, it, it, it had the contact comfort, absolutely. But that is an inanimate object that cannot be attentive. So it doesn't watch what that monkey's doing, and that's something the monkey needs. It needs that mother to respond to what it's doing, and without that, it has an insecure attachment and becomes overwhelmed with anxiety. Now, like I said before, separation anxiety, stranger anxiety, perfectly normal. Perfectly normal. It starts at about eight months when they're developing those schemas. So you can see this uh, dramatic incline from about seven and a half months on. And it peaks at about 13 months. There's no difference between being raised at home and being in daycare. I guess there's a, a slight difference in that those that are raised in daycare are a little bit more comfortable with being separated, but not by much. Um, so, separation anxiety, stranger anxiety, perfectly normal. Something you actually want in your kids. You want them to be a little bit wary of strangers. Uh, and you want them to be a little bit uncomfortable when they leave their parents' side because they know that that parent is who's keeping them alive. So what happens, like the case of Harry Harlow's monkeys, when they're not able to develop attachment? Well, Romanian orphans, uh, in, in an orphanage study where they had far too many orphans uh, and not enough caregivers, so these babies were essentially picked up maybe once or twice a day, primarily for feeding and changing diapers. No social interaction whatsoever. Uh, if they were in this situation for longer than eight months, they had lasting consequences for their emotional, social, physical development. Um, so what we see is that these children that don't have an ability to form an attachment become withdrawn, frightened, and sometimes unable to develop speech. So an example of uh, not being able to develop a secure attachment. I don't know of anybody that was abused by their primary caregiver that developed a secure attachment. It doesn't make sense, right? I mean, why would you want to become attached to something that is hurting you? Especially a secure attachment. So, most people that were abused wind up having insecure attachments. As a, as a result, they often become withdrawn, frightened. Um, but, what we find is that that doesn't mean that they then become abusers. And I've seen this multiple times on Reddit, so I want to set the record straight here. Most abusers were abused. That is true. So, if you've never, ever been abused, your likelihood of becoming an abuser is very, very, very low. Got it, right? Makes sense. Now, most abusers were abused. But does that mean that being abused predisposes you to abuse? Not as much as you might think. So there's a lot of people, you know, I read this one comment on Reddit that just made me so sad. Uh, that there was a young man uh, that was sexually molested by an uncle or something to that effect. And uh, his sister knew about it, and as such, absolutely refused to let him see his nieces and nephews because she was terrified that he would then abuse them because he was abused. That's not how it works. And while it's higher than the average population, only about 30% of people who were abused go on to become abusers themselves. So we take in these experiences, and they change how we interact with other people, but they don't necessarily make us become monsters. So if parental or caregiving support is deprived for a long amount of time, the children are basically at risk for physical, psychological, social problems. Uh, and this isn't, you know, like I said, just, you know, thought-based. And, and as we learned earlier, everything psychological is inherently biological and everything biological is inherently chemical. So what we see is down at the chemical level, prolonged deprivation actually results in alterations in your brain serotonin levels. So there are some biological and chemical consequences for depriving your child of a, an appropriate attachment. 
Now I showed you that spiffy little chart with uh, daycare. Oops, sorry. Uh, and, and what we found with the daycare is that, uh, you know, quality daycare, as long as they have a responsive adult, doesn't harm their attachment with their primary caregivers at all. Uh, in fact, daycare is great. It has a lot of really great benefits, including improved uh, socialization. One of the downsides, though, is that we often see that children in daycare settings do become a little bit more aggressive and possibly even more defiant. So as we are developing, we're learning more about our world, but we're also learning more about ourself. And so between uh, the ages of about 15 and 18 months, babies begin to really develop a self-concept. And what that means is who they are. Not just who they are emotionally, but even who they are physically. And they can recognize themselves in the mirror at this point. So one of the things that they do to test whether or not an infant can recognize themselves in the mirror is by doing what's known as the rouge task. So with this example right here, let's look at this little baby, this adorable little baby. Someone puts a red dot on her cheek right there and then puts her in front of a mirror. Now a baby that has no self-concept will just kind of look at the other baby and be like, who's this other baby? That's awesome. What's up, little baby? But once they begin to develop self-concept, they will look at the mirror, notice that there is a red dot on the cheek of the individual in the mirror, and start to rub their own cheek and try and figure out if it's on their own cheek. And once they know that it is, it's like, oh, yeah, that is me in the mirror. Now, things like the cognitive and the social and the interpersonal aspect of who they are develops as we continue to age. And by the time you're about 10, your self-image is pretty darn stable. You know who you are as a person. So, one of the things that I said earlier is that it's important to let kids fail. It's important to let them fail before they're 10. Because once they hit about 10, if they've got an entitlement attitude, it might be sticking around. So, you know what? Let your kids fail. Let them suck at life, because by sucking at life, they learn more about who they are, and they become these little scientists, these little experimenters, and they learn what they're good at, so they can truly excel at the things that they're good at, instead of being, you know, Kyle Broflovsky wanting to be in the NBA. It's just not going to happen, you know? He's too short. So letting kids fail is important in developing their self-concept. So when I talked about environmental experiences on behavior, I said that, that parents aren't as important as you might think. They're important, don't get me wrong. And here's one of the most important ways in which they impact development. Their child rearing style. So there's authoritarian, permissive, and authoritative. You do not want to be authoritarian. Authoritarian parents are the ones that absolutely require that their kids follow rules, they expect obedience, and they do not listen when the kid has something that might mean that perhaps a rule needs to be broken. Right? You don't want to be that guy. These are the parents that say, you're right and I'm wrong. You're small, um, or I'm sorry, I'm right and you're wrong, I'm big and you're small. These are the ones that say, do it because I told you to do it. That's not a good parenting style. Permissive is also not a good parenting style. These are the parents that give their children whatever the hell they want. Uh, and, and not all parents are one or the other. Sometimes there's a mix. Uh, you can have a, a mix of this going on, but permissive parents are the ones that basically give their kids whatever they want, you know? And it's a really shitty parenting style because then kids don't learn boundaries. The last one, and this is the one that we should all strive towards, is an authoritative child rearing uh, perspective. These are the ones that demand that their children do well, 
but respond to any circumstances that might prohibit them from doing well. So, uh, you know, I mean, these are the parents that listen to their kids' arguments and judge them and, and say, well, I'm not going to let you do that, and here's why. So this is never the parent that says, you're going to do it because I told you to. This is the parent that sits down and says, this is why we're doing this. It makes sense, and it's going to work out the best for you. And so authoritative parenting is the one that gives the best outcomes. So in all these studies that have looked at parenting style and looked at social outcomes, authoritative parenting comes out on top every single time. So shoot for this and you'll have normal kids. That's all I got to say for this lecture. Uh, next lecture will be headed by Comicspedia. He's going to be doing uh, adolescence. And so be sure to stop in for that. Thanks for stopping by.